Church. I am grateful that you are with us today. Uh, we are a congregation of what's known as the United Church of Christ, and our guiding statement is that we embrace all as we journey the way of Jesus. And so we embrace you wherever you might be, however you are showing up and being a part of this time of worship. I do want to share one thing of uh, some changes coming in uh, what we're going to be doing online. You're going to notice over the coming weeks our services are going to be a little bit shorter than what they've been. Um, just as we've talked to folks who've been participating and also looking at just some of the, the, the statistics we get, vast majority of folks who are connecting to these services are, are just really focusing on the scripture and the sermon. They just kind of skip ahead to that and kind of go with that. So um, we're really going to center our online uh, service on that part of what we're doing. So you, we'll have some music that will still be interspersed in there, um, but it won't be quite as consistent as we've been doing. We'll have some other pieces we'll bring in from time to time, but we're really going to be centering in on uh, the scripture and the message uh, each week. We also, in addition to that being posted in video on YouTube and our Facebook page and our church website, is we are going to also be offering this as a podcast, audio podcast, so that you can download that, listen to it in your car, wherever you might be. Uh, so that will also be coming in uh, the weeks ahead. So just know that will be there in addition to what we're doing uh, by video online. Last other thing I wanted to note, you may already hear it right now in the background as I'm talking, maybe hearing some grinding or some drilling. That's because just right that way, um, outside the door, we've got some folks who are starting to do some concrete work on the outside of the building that needed, that's been needing to be done badly for, some, for a while. Um, so anyway, just kind of got that going on in the background is what it is. So anyway, grateful that you are with us today, and I pray that God speaks to you in a very real and a very powerful way as we share God's Word and reflecting on God's Word together today. Our scripture readings today may seem a bit unusual, um, and they come from a part of scripture we don't often spend a lot of time in. It comes from uh, the book of Numbers and from the book of Deuteronomy in uh, the Old Testament or also known as the Hebrew Scriptures. So uh, from Numbers chapter 35 verses 9 through 15. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, so that a slayer who kills a person without intent may flee there. The cities shall be for you a refuge for the avenger, so that the slayer may not die until there is a trial before the congregation. The cities you shall designate shall be six cities of refuge for you. You shall designate three beyond the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan. These six cities shall serve as a refuge for the Israelites, for the resident or transient alien among them, so that anyone who kills a person without intent may flee there. And then from Deuteronomy chapter 19, beginning in verse 15. A single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained. If a malicious witness comes forward to accuse someone of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days, and the judges shall make a thorough inquiry. If the witness is a false witness, having testified falsely against another, then you shall do to the false witness just as the false witness had meant to do to the other. And so you shall purge the evil from your midst. The rest shall hear and be afraid, and such a crime as this shall never again be committed among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, take these, um, these words that, that may seem very different from what we maybe normally are used to hearing in Scripture, and let them speak into our lives and into our world today. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. One of the great things about what I experience sometimes as a pastor is to see how things that I was involved with or partner with in years past continue to connect and meet with folks. So about 20 years ago, in my uh, first congregation I served as an associate pastor, my wife Amy and I started a Theology at the Movies group with some of the people of the congregation. And so we would meet several times a year. We'd have a series of like four or six or eight films that we would watch on our own during the course of uh, that, that time. And then each Sunday we would discuss and go deeper with one of those films. 
And uh, over the years that I was there, we did a whole bunch of films. And it's really fun for me now as I read the church newsletter and continue to see that that group continues to meet uh, and, and continues to connect in that way. So that's just a wonderful gift for me. But when we started the group, we really had several purposes in mind. It wasn't just because there was a group of us, we all like movies and, you know, in a place like South Dakota, especially in the winter, well, movies was a great way to be able to get out and do something without being super cold. So, um, but it was more than just us because we like movies and we wanted to do something with it. There, was, there were some other purposes behind it. So the first purpose was that we wanted to help work, train ourselves, train the group in how do we have what we take in the world around us be in conversation with scripture and with our faith. That it isn't something where, you know, our faith is one piece and then kind of the entertainment that we, we take in, movies, television, and so forth is a separate piece, but instead that they're in conversation with one another. There's a famous theologian named uh, Reinhold Niebuhr who is uh, credited saying that as people of faith we are to um, engage the world with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That it's not one over the other, but instead how they're in conversation with one another. And so we wanted to work towards how we do that with how we engage things in our lives and in the, in, in, in the media especially around us. So how those are in conversation with one another. That was the first purpose. The second purpose was we wanted to give people an opportunity to have a doorway into talking about their faith with others. Sharing about our faith is not always the easiest thing to do. You know, just coming up to someone and saying, hey, let me tell you about Jesus, right? That kind of turns some people off pretty quickly, right? But most of us don't really have a problem saying, hey, you know what? I watched this movie over the weekend. I want to tell you about it. Or we streamed this show on, on Netflix or Hulu or something like that. I'll, let's talk about it, right? We can, you know, get into that. But when we are engaging those things with our faith, it's something that we can maybe then in those conversations be able to say, oh yeah, you know, and this kind of speaks to something about, you know, how it is that, uh, you know, I, I believe God wants me to live my life or something I heard my pastor talking about this in, in a sermon uh, that she shared uh, the other week, that we can use that as a doorway into sharing about matters of faith. And then there's a third purpose, which is, that film enables us, and, and knew this with television, with, with, with books as well, but film especially can really bring us into the stories and circumstances of people that we might not otherwise know about. And so, for example, one of the series that we did in our Theology at the Movies group was, was a series of social topics. So we did uh, the movie Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee about racism. We, we looked at the documentary Bowling for Columbine about gun culture in America. We watched a movie called The Matthew Shepard Story about uh, homosexuality and about gender-based violence in our world. And then uh, we also watched a movie about the death penalty called Dead Man Walking. All of these were ones that helped us to engage those situations and those stories that it wasn't just, okay, we're going to talk about gun control today. Boom, there we go, leave it there. But instead it was, okay, how do we respond to the story of what we saw? The circumstances and the conversations that took place in there. It brings us into those areas and so that's why this movie Just Mercy was chosen for this week for that same kind of idea because this movie leads us into a story the story of Walter McMillan that we might not otherwise have known about or have been able to experience ourselves we see through the work of what, what's known as the Equal Justice Initiative this organization founded by Brian Stevenson whose purpose initial purpose was to start about how do you work to overturn wrongful convictions in our justice system. And they are there. I mean, the reality is, is that there are many people in prison today, you know, facing long sentences, people who are on the death, on death row, who have been wrongly convicted. Walter McMillan is, is one of them. Another one, Anthony Ray Hinton, is another. There are many, many others, well over 2,000 people who just in the last several decades have had their convictions overturned because they were wrong, they were uh, used wrongful testimony, wrongful evidence, and so forth. 
And so that was the work of Brian Stevenson. And so this movie, based on the book that, that Stevenson wrote, enters us into the story of Walter McMillan to get a sense of what he went through and the work of the Equal Justice Initiative that continues to this day. Now you might be saying, okay, we're like eight minutes, seven, eight minutes into the sermon and Ed, you haven't said anything about scripture. You're right, I haven't. So I wanted to kind of set that scene to remind us that in this story, you know, this story, this, this uh, story of Walter McMillan and Just Mercy and the larger issues about wrongful convictions, this is something God cares about as well. Scripture speaks to this. And it's really powerful that in the midst of some of the things that, that are in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament, like if you're doing our one-year Bible reading, you know, if you're like me, there's, a, there's some points as we're reading through some of the stories that are there that it gets really tiring and like, how does this fit with, with what life is today? You know, I'm here and reading this story about this conquest and these people dying and this happening and so forth, and it can feel really overwhelming. And, and yet in the midst, woven in between, are these glimpses of something that's really radical and really powerful, which is that in a culture, this, this is thousands of years ago, in a culture where justice, by and large, in many places, was done by mob rule, right? There wasn't the justice system that we have today. There weren't the structures that we have in place in our country and many other countries in our world, right? In the midst of that, there is this woven sense of making sure that justice is done fairly and correctly. And that's where those two scripture passages today speak to this, from the book of Numbers and from the book of Deuteronomy. That in the book of Numbers, it's talking about as they begin to enter into the promised land, that they're to set up cities of refuge. That somebody who has been accused of murder can flee to those cities and have safety until such a time that a trial can take place. That is significant. That there is in this a sense of making sure that the accused has rights and is safe until such a time as a trial can take place and justice can be enacted. Fair justice and right justice can be enacted. That is a powerful thing to think about. That again, in those days where there was so much that was about mob violence that was about, you know, eye for an eye type of thing. Here is a sense of let's make sure that fairness and justice are done right. And then that next passage that I read from the book of Deuteronomy, also part of the books of the law, the five books of Moses known as the Torah, that a single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of, notice this, any crime or wrongdoing, any crime, not just murder, any crime. That the testimony, the concurring testimony of two or three witnesses is necessary. And that there's also a punishment for those who offer false testimony. Again, this is powerful stuff. This is radical stuff for that time. That the, the, the sense of this is that any justice needs to be done correctly. It's not just about getting something done. It's about getting it done right. The fact is, is that in the story of Walter McMillan and Just Mercy, the story of Anthony Ray Hinton, who's talked about in the book, their convictions were largely on the basis of a single witness, ignoring forensic evidence, ignoring testimony that contradicted that single witness. And yet here it is in scripture that no person should be convicted on the testimony of a single witness. So this is one of those places. This film leads us into conversation with scripture how these things speak together and what that calls of us. And so what does that call us to do, right? I'm not a lawyer. 
I'm not a judge. I don't work in the justice system. But I do have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to call upon my leaders, Congress, the Senate, and the President, locally, to be sure that we are working to make sure that our justice system is the fairest that it can be. Right? We have a wonderful justice system in many ways, but it's not perfect. It is not perfect. And so our job is to continue to do that work that helps shape that to focus on fairness and true and equal justice because that's what God cares about. And the fact is, at some point, you're going to get called for jury duty. So am I. And so if we're sitting on a jury, we have that responsibility on us as we hear the witnesses, as we hear the testimony to do everything we can to make sure that fair and equal justice is done. So that's upon us. And that we have a call to pray for and support those such as Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative and other groups that are working for advocacy for those who have been wrongly convicted, the people who have lost literally decades of their lives because they've been wrongfully committed, wrongfully convicted. This is the, one of those calls that is upon us. This is where we take the newspaper and the Bible, bring them into conversation and how it is we live out our faith. So I encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to watch Just Mercy this week, take some time and watch it. If you're not a movie person, go check out the book from the library, pick up the book at a uh, bookstore, read it, and, and, and allow that story to speak into your life about how it is we can be a part of God's work for justice in this world. Let us pray. Lord God, we do pray for this work that is before us. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those who work in the justice system. We pray for equal and fair justice to take place in our country and throughout this world. We know it's not always there. And we pray for those, Brian Stevens and Equal Justice Initiative and so many others who are working to do everything they can to be sure that justice is done rightly and fairly. Give us the courage to speak out, to speak up, and to do the work that you call us to do. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. And so my friends, go out today, the grace, the peace, the love, and the joy of God the Creator, Jesus the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit the Sustainer, amen. <laughs>